Let's read from 9 on. It says, In this manner, therefore, pray, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Jesus didn't give us this prayer and said, pray this. He says, pray like this, after this manner. This is kind of an outline, you know. He doesn't want us to use vain repetition. He doesn't want us just to repeat the same old prayers all the time. Although some people go through some stuff and then they repeat the same prayers. It's like, Lord, you need to fix this. I'm still waiting for this, you know. And you find Jesus repeating prayers and you find Paul repeating prayers. And it's not wrong as long as you're bringing your heart with you, you know. So, you know, as kingdom kids, this, is, this should be our heart. We're going to our Father, right? Our Father. And then notice it's not my Father. In this prayer, you're part of the family. And when we pray, we're praying for the family, and we're praying selfishly also. You know, it's give us this day our daily bread. It's, it's we still have needs here. But he he talks about one thing in this prayer. He says, forgive us our debts as we forgive those who are indebted to us. And we roll that off of the old tongue sometimes really cheaply, right? Lord, I need forgiveness, but those guys that are beating up on me, Lord, get them, you know? And sometimes if you're, if you're reading through the Psalms, you can think that was David's heart too. Lord, bless me and kill them, right? Lord, bless me, take care of me, whoop up on them, you know, they deserve it. But, you know, as Jesus leaves this prayer outline, he goes back and touches on one subject. He says in verse 14, For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Now, some people... And I've heard it taught this way. Some people make this a law. Unless you forgive your brother, you're out of the kingdom. You're not in there. What they forget is the overwhelming passages in the New Testament says you are saved by grace and not by works, not by efforts, not by anything you do. You're saved by grace. So this is not a salvation issue. This is a fellowship issue. Do you want fellowship with God? Do you want to be able to hang out with Him? Do you want to be able to bring your, your worship and your praise and your prayers and your needs and all of that stuff to an open and receptive God? Or do you want Him to put up a little wall between you and Him? Oh, you're saved. There's just no fellowship going on. We're God's kids. But a kid can on purpose move away from his parents, right? Right? I mean, I've had that happen. I had, I had a kid move to Virginia, you know, and it kind of interrupts some fellowship. I don't know how that works with you, but, you know, I, I'm not usually driving 2,500 miles, you know, every week to go see somebody. So, you know, every once in a while, I pick up the phone or you'll text or you'll do some stupid thing, but it kind of interrupts the fellowship. Our Father so loved us that He sent His only begotten Son to go to that cross and to pay for our sins, for our transgressions, for our iniquities, for our failings, right? And he did it freely, undeservedly. So he looks at us and he goes, guys, I would like you to imitate, to walk after. I would like you to be chips off the old block. I'd like you to be a little me, you know? And have that same heart, have that same desire. So the heart of a child of God should be wide open to forgiveness. But I know, we live in the real world, right? You've been hurt. You've been deceived, you've been ripped off, you've been abused, you've been taken advantage of. I get it. So does Jesus. He gets it too. 
You know, Jesus came and died for a bunch of sinners who were at war with him. And then he draws us to him and he says, yeah, you're going to have people at war with you, but I want you to die to self for them. I want you to just forgive them. Not if they come to you and apologize. Not if they come back to you and make everything right, repay and, you know, do all of that stuff. No, no ifs involved. I just want you to forgive. You know, in Matthew chapter 18, he's going to hit on this again, but I'm just going to read through this passage. In Matthew chapter 18, starting at verse 21, it says this. Then Peter came to the Lord and said, Lord, how often shall I forgive my brother's sin against me? Should I forgive him up to seven times? And Peter was stepping way out of the box here. Seven times. I mean, imagine that. Some guy jerking you around seven times in a row, and you go, I forgive you, I forgive you, I forgive you. He stepped way up to the plate there. And what does Jesus say? Oh, no, 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 not seven times, Peter. Seventy times seven. 490 times, Lord? Are you crazy? And, and what's implied there is you're not supposed to be keeping track of the 490 times. But even if you are, if that person, you know, you got 487 times. <laughs> Just a couple more times and he's unforgiven. I can throw him out. And that guy comes and says, man, I'm really sorry. You got to start all over again. You got to wipe out all of those requirements and start with one. He says, therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like the kingdom of heaven. That's where we are, right? That's what Jesus is talking about. He's talking about how the kingdom of heaven is going to work and what it's supposed to look like. He says, therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. And when he had begun to settle account, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. Now, a talent is somewhere between 75 and 100 pounds of gold or silver. Can you imagine 75 pound chunk of gold over here and you got to stack up 10,000 of those. That's what this guy owed. That's impossible, right? That's unpayable. And notice as we talk about this, all the servants of the Lord are indebted to the Lord. There's a picture there. We're all indebted to him. But he was not able to pay. So his master commanded that he be sold with his wife and with his children and all that they had that payment might be made. And the servant therefore fell down before him saying, Master, have patience with me and I will pay you all. Then the master of that servant, notice this, was moved with compassion. Released him and forgave him his debt. This is what has happened to you and I. As we have fallen before our Lord, our Master, He has forgiven us all of our debt. Right? Every stupid thought, every dumb thing we've ever done. Oh, thank you, Jesus, for that. Right? But that servant went out and found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. Now, a denarii is a day's wage. So he, he owed him about a hundred days, about a third of a year's wages. So he owed him 10 grand. And he laid his hands on that guy and took him by the throat, saying, pay me what you owe me. So this fellow servant fell down at his feet and begged him, saying, notice these words. Have patience with me and I will pay you all. Isn't that exactly what that guy asked for? But he would not. But he went and threw him into prison till he should pay the very last debt. So his fellow servants, his fellow servants went to the master and told him what had happened. Then his master calls him back in and says, you wicked servant. I don't want to hear that. You ever want to hear that from Jesus? You wicked servant. Now, I'm kind of looking forward to well done, good and faithful servant. 
I don't, you know, somewhere in between. I don't want that, you wicked servant. I forgave you all your debt because you begged me. Should you not have had compassion on your fellow servant? Just as I had pity on you, and the master was angry and delivered him to the tortures. I don't know what that is, and I don't want to know. Until he should pay all that was due him. So my heavenly Father will do to each of you who from his heart does not forgive his brother's trespass. The, the key is that last line. Who from his heart does not forgive. Right? Now, again, I do not think this is a law. I don't. We're saved by grace, not by works. But, you know, then again, I wouldn't trust my understanding of it because I've taught a lot of things wrong in my life. <laughs> you know, I was lucky to get out of Bonneville High School. So you guys should, uh, you know, do your own homework, right? Be, be Bereans. You know, if, if the Bereans, Acts chapter 17... Those people that Paul went to, and he taught them all day, and then they would go home and open the scriptures to see if what he said was so. If they had to do with that with Paul, you guys very much need to do that with Mark. You know, I see this. I see forgiveness as fruit coming out of a grateful heart of what God has done in our lives. If you don't have it, if you're struggling with it, you need to get on your knees and say, Lord, look in my heart. There's unforgiveness. There's pride. There's anger. There's hate. There's this. You, you need to get that cleaned out of there. I'm on board. I'm willing. Lord, you gotta, you got to show me. you got to work with me. When we don't forgive, it points to a bad heart. It points to pride, to selfishness, to a hard heart. These are the very reasons we're supposed to forgive. So we don't have those issues bound up inside of us. But those things are the very things that are interrupting our fellowship with God. Until we're willing to deal with that heart, we have a broken family relationship. You know, in 1 John 4.20 it says this, if someone says, I love God, and yet hates his brother, that guy is a liar. Man, that's kind of harsh. I love God. I can't stand that guy. Oh, I love Jesus. Can't stand you. Oh, I love God. You know, I hear that all the time. It says, for he who does not love his brother whom he has seen, you're, you're intimately aware of the people you're surrounded with. How can he say he loves God who he's never seen? What if God's just like that guy? And this commandment we have from, from him that he who loves God must also love his brother. That can be a tough one, right? Grow up in an abusive relationship. You, you had one when you got married or you're going through struggles or things happen and there's, there's these feelings, there's this anger. Get over it. And the best way to get over it is get on your knees and say, God, fix this thing. I don't need to be looking at that thing. It's this thing that's the problem. So in verse 16, Moreover, when you fast, do not be like the hypocrites, with a sad countenance, for they disfigure their faces that they may appear to be men fasting. <laughs> Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. But you, when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face so that you do not appear to men to be fasting, but to your Father who is in secret. And your Father who is in the secret place will reward you openly. Now, fasting, interesting. It says when you fast, not if you fast. This should be a, I don't know if it's a continual practice with us, but every once in a while, you, you should think about this. And fasting is not a hunger strike. Lord, I'm going on a hunger strike until you answer this prayer. I, I don't think that's the uh, proper heart. I don't think that's the attitude. Fasting is literally putting off this flesh. It's taking control of your physical desires, 
so that your spiritual desires can sharpen. <laughs> it, it allows you to better hear that still, small voice, right? Now, but fasting is not just physical. Fasting is not just putting off food because I, I've done that. I've had days of fasting where I fast, but it didn't involve the Lord. I got up. I was too busy to eat breakfast. I won't go right through lunch. Didn't even think about it. Uh, uh, it's no big deal. I'll give up dinner. And the next morning, you know, I break my fast with breakfast, right? And, and it's like, but was that really for the Lord? No, there has to be devotion. You have to be seeking the Lord during that time out with food in order for it to be a real fast. There has to be devotion. Isaiah 58 is the classic resource on fasting. You ever want to know why you fast, how you should fast, you know, all of these questions, you know, what do I fast about, you know. That kind of explains it, you know, it's called God's chosen fast. Fasting is good when you're seeking salvation for someone, for the lost, when you're praying about witnessing to somebody, it's, it's a great idea. When you're going through some heavy storm, some sickness, you need to be set free. When you're going through stuff like that, great time to fast. If you or somebody you know is burdened down, oppressed, fasting is good to break that yoke. It's an opportunity to share what you have with others. Lord, I'm going to give up food tomorrow and give my lunch money to Bill because he hasn't had lunch in a week, you know. It's a good time to do that. God says in Isaiah 58 that if you, do, if you fast for these reasons, this is what happens to you. Then your light shall break forth like the morning. Your healing shall spring forth speedily. Your righteousness shall go before you. The glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard. Then you shall call and the Lord will answer. Then you shall cry and he shall say, here am I. You ever had those times where you're not connecting with God? Good way to connect. If you take away the yoke from your midst the pointing of the finger, and the speaking of wickedness. If you extend your soul to the hungry and satisfy the afflicted soul, then your light shall dawn in the darkness. Your darkness shall be as noonday. The Lord will guide you continually and satisfy your soul in drought and strengthen your bones. You shall be like a watered garden, like a spring of water whose waters do not fail. Man, I want to be that guy, right? So maybe you should think about fasting once in a while. I, I probably need to. Jesus adds a few notes to that for us. He says, when you fast, don't go around looking like you're fasting. Oh, it's so hard. Uh, no Cheerios this morning. I can feel it already. You know? You ever met anybody like that? In Jesus' day, there were those who fasted. The Pharisees would fast every Monday and every Thursday. And they would do this. They wouldn't wash their face or comb their hair. They would walk around looking so pathetic. Look at how holy I am. I'm fasting for the Lord. Really, it looks like you're fasting for you. It looks like you're fasting to be seen of men. You know? But the people would look at them. Oh, what a godly person they are because they're, they're fasting today. That's right. How devout they are. You know? It's hypocrisy. They're trying to appear more righteous than they really are. And because they were seen by men and men took notice of them, they lost their godly reward. They lost whatever reward they were supposed to get. But you, I like that, but you, when you fast, wash your face, comb your hair, don't, don't get that look on your face. Go about life like nobody knows what you're up to. Put a smile on your face and joy in your heart, you know. 
Let no one be the wiser. And when your father sees what you're doing in secret, then there will be open rewards. Fasting can be a meal. It can be a couple of meals. It can be 24 hours. You know, it could be a day. It could be several days. We always think about it as food. It doesn't have to be food. It can be something you love. I've done fasts of TV. I'm not going to watch TV for three months. I'm not going to do this. You know, Daniel ate no pleasant food for 21 days. Just broccoli and kale, apparently. <laughs> you know, not even ranch dressing. That's, I'm sorry, that's pleasant. I can't, can't do that. You can give up chocolate. Now, some of you guys, well, that's no big deal. You know, but for Mark, I'd have to, like, give up chips or something. It's like, are you kidding me? A day without chips? Lord, take me home now. <laughs> you, you know what would stir you, right? Again, fasting is control over the physical, but it's also releasing of the spiritual it's lord every time i think about hunger every time i think about food i'm going to pray i'm going to seek your face i'm going to bring up what i'm what i'm struggling with or what i'm what i'm in this thing for you should be adding time in prayer adding time in the word adding devotion to that fasting experience and then verse 19, do not lay up for yourselves treasure on earth. Where else can I put my treasure? Where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Lay up treasures. This could be money. It could be food, it could be clothing, it can be houses, material goods, it can be whatever, you know. What's your treasure? If, if you just had to answer that question, one word, what's, what, what's your treasure? So your 401k, what is it? Let me ask you some questions. Can moths destroy it? <laughs> they in your closet chewing away, you know? They out there in the seat of your old truck, no, 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 you know. Does, does rust come into play with your treasure? Man, he's back there. No, no, got nothing. Yeah, I, I get it, you know. That rust thing. Do thieves, can thieves break in and steal your treasure? How many things don't come under that list? Not very many. But you, you should be laying up treasure in heaven. Did you know you could send it ahead? Did you know there's an account you can just be investing in? How do you do that? Well, it's really simple, but we don't like the answer. Here it is. Give it away. Give it away. Hmm. Give it to the Lord. Give it to his work. Give it for his kingdom. Give it to the poor and the needy and the sick. Give it. You know, you should give towards missions. And I've been going to tell you guys, and I got a perfect opportunity. For a couple of months now, we have been supporting a pastor in India. We as a congregation. And this guy, his name is... Ranjit Nag. I like it. Ranjit Nag. And he is in Varanasi, India. And if you look at India, he's, you know, you should draw a line through India. And anything south is open to Christianity. And anything north, they literally say, go north and die. He's in the north. That's a tough district to be a pastor. 
our little church, you know, sometimes we can barely afford to keep the lights on, but we're supporting this guy because I think missions, I think outreach is important. Do you support missionaries? Do you support missions? Do you support pastors or worship leaders or radio or TV broadcasts of the gospel? You know, there are kids' homes. There are orphanages. There are HIV clinics. There's a lot of Christian places sharing the gospel that we could be supporting. Right? It's all about, are you spending and being spent for the kingdom of God? That's how you send stuff ahead. I heard this letter the other day. This pastor was going to do a passage on, on heaven. And so he re- this pastor receives this letter from one of his congregants, a little older guy. And this letter goes something like this. He says, I would love to be there and hear that message, but I find myself critically ill and I'm not sure if I'm going to make it. But he says, I've been holding a deed to a piece of ground in heaven for many years now. And I've been sending building supplies there for some 50 years. I don't own the land, but it was deeded to me by the king. And I'm trusting the Lord that he is preparing a place for me there. He's building my house. The Lord took seven years or seven days to build this creation we're fascinated with, and he's been up there for 2,000 years building our new place. Can you imagine what that would be like? And he says, while I'm super excited to hear about your vision of heaven, next week I might be there. So I might miss your sermon, you know? This guy is already there. This guy is so sure. He's so assured of his position. He's so assured, man, I've been sending building materials. I've been sending stuff to the Lord. He's going to take care of it. You know, I was just reading through John 14 yesterday, you know. I go to prepare a place for you, that where I am, there you may be, you know. He's going to prepare that place. Where's your heart? Where's your heart? Well, Mark, I just want to go to heaven. I just don't want to go today. Right? You ever hear anybody say that? Well, I'm looking forward to heaven, but maybe, you know, in like five or ten years, I'm still busy fishing and and golfing. And and I got a few appointments around here, you know, I need to take care of. And I really, you know, I'm just old enough, I really don't get that attitude anymore. I'm ready to go the moment he says. If I hear, it's either Rihanna or it's, Man, is the Lord blowing a trumpet? We're out of here, you know. I don't know what it is. I'm I'm excited because I'm ready. Oh, yeah, I still have some loved ones that need to come to Christ. I'm praying for them, but that should not interrupt my little heart ready to go, you know. It's easy to do a quick check of where your treasure is. What do you worry about? Hmm. What are you stressing over? Where do you spend your time and your money? You know, 1 Timothy 6, it says, Command those who are rich in this present age not to be haughty, nor to trust in those uncertain riches, but in the living God who gives to us richly all things to enjoy. Notice, he gives us all all things to enjoy if you're one of those and you've got a couple of bucks enjoy it right that's why he gave it to you don't be selfish but enjoy he goes on to say let them do good that they may be rich in good works 
ready to give, willing to share, storing up for themselves a good foundation for the time to come that they may lay hold on eternal life. Oh, yeah. If you're rich, send some stuff ahead. Store it up for eternity. James 5 says this. Come now, you rich. Weep and howl for your miseries that are coming upon you. Your riches are corrupted. And your garments are moth-eaten, rust and moths in this, in this thing. Your gold and silver are corroded, and their corrosion will be a witness against you and will eat your flesh like fire. You have heaped up treasure in the last days. It's not the fact that you're rich. God says nothing about being rich or poor. It doesn't matter which one you are. It's never that. It's... Do you have riches or do riches have you? Who's in control? You know, Abraham, we're told that Abraham was overloaded with gold. What? Well, I'd help him out. Just let me know, you know? In this, in this thing in James, it says the corrosion of your gold and silver, the corruption. It's like you got a big pile of it, and it's just sitting there. It's not moving. It's not being used. It's not doing anything. And he says, that's what's going to witness against you. We're to be investors, investors in the kingdom. What's the best and most promising investment you've ever heard of? Kingdom of God for me. Jesus said, if you have done it to the least of these, you've done it unto me. When you give to the poor, when you help that single widow with the four kids, when you step in and help the downcast and the brokenhearted and the poor, when you support the church, when you support those who preach the gospel, the missions, the evangelists, when you help the orphans, he sees what you do in secret and the reward will be opened. And then in verse 22, the lamp of the body is the eye. If therefore your eye is good, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If therefore that light that is in you is darkness, how great is that darkness? And I have studied, I have looked, I have racked my brain on this passage for months. What does that mean? How does my eye either be light or dark? Well, how do you see things in this world? Do you have a singleness, a vision towards the kingdom of God and the things of God? You're looking for the good in the world. Oh, you know the world's corrupted. You know it's, it's ugly and getting uglier, right? But you still have a smile on your face and a twinkle in your eye, and you're like, no, God is still at work. I'm still his kid. We're still going this direction, you know. Jesus said, at another place, he says, you believers are now the light of the world. You're born again. You're brand new. You're, you're my bright, shiny creations. You're like stars in the heavens, you know, if you will. So if your eye is light, seeing and searching for the kingdom of God, for the truth, how to share that, how to care for others, how to bless others. You want to just be a helpful little soul down here. You want to be a blessing and not a curse. If that's you, your eye is light. But if your eye is darkness, if you're not really looking towards God's kingdom, that's kind of taken care of. You know, I got that fire insurance thing. I said that prayer that time, and I'm kind of covered there, so I just want to be covered for the next 50 years with all my stuff and all my ways. You know, it's, it's no longer his ways and his kingdom. Now it's all about me and my kingdom. Then your whole body becomes darkness because what your eye sees and how you see it affects what you do. 
then no effort, no giving, no trying comes out of you because you're selfish. Are you focused on the bad, on the evil, on the wickedness? Or are you here to make a difference? And you're praying and you're searching and you're going, you're wide open, Lord, I found an extra 20 bucks today and I really don't need it. Is there anybody out here that needs extra 20 bucks? What's going on? Are you living with the kingdom in view? Or are you living with you in view? Isn't it funny? One is the eyes of light. One is the eyes of darkness. And if you have eyes of light, then your whole body will be filled with light. And if you have eyes of darkness, then you're collapsing in on yourself and your whole life will turn into darkness. Now, doing some of these things I said may not make you rich in this world. You just start giving stuff away. God promises you, you'll never outgive me. You give it away, I'll give it back. You see, we don't just live for this 80 or 90 or 100 years down here. We have eternity. And 80 or 90 years is going to be a blip. You won't even really remember it. You know, it's like those songs say, when we've been there 10,000 years. <laughs> I can't even get my mind around that, you know. I've been here like 60. What's it going to be like there 10,000 years? We will look back and go, man, I've no less cause to praise his name, to sing his glory, you know. We can send that stuff away. We can invest in the kingdom, and we need to do that here. And then verse 24. No one can serve two masters. For either he will love the one or hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Jesus compares mammon, which was money or property, to God. The truth is, now I don't know if you've experienced this, I've experienced this, that money is a great slave. Money is fantastic when you control it. I got money and I can spend for this and I can go for that and I can do this with it. But when it becomes your master, it is one horrible taskmaster, isn't it? The late bills coming in. The battery in the 14 cars, you know, three of the batteries go dead this week. And you're like, oh man, batteries, I got, I got, and tires. And then just trying to fill them up with gas. Some of you guys know what I'm talking about. You roll up there and you got to plug your card in three times to fill the tank up. It's like, what's going on? I wish this place would get more than the $100 limit. Jinka, 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 jinka. You could, you guys should read scriptures while you're, while you're pumping gas. You need a lot more scripture reading in. You get the credit cards. You get the loans. You know, we Americans, we love to divide our life into the spiritual life <laughs> and the material life, right? Well, that, that doesn't really come over into here, and that, just keep that over there. And, and we love to divide. Jesus never divides our life that way. Never. He doesn't give us access to that divide. It is not wrong to own things. It is wrong when they own you. Right? Do the things of this life control your decisions? Well, that's a tough one. I'm speaking to the, to the speaker here. It's wrong when they do. So, so here's a great question. Are you controlled by the Spirit of God? Or are you controlled by this world and the things of this world? When, when you write out your bills, is it the things of this world? Is it the Spirit of God that's controlling the amounts and the things I'm putting down in there? 
Jesus, as he goes through this portion in this passage, he's, he's walking us through what a godly life looks like. This is what it looks like, guys. And he's laying down some of these basic ground rules. And the most basic ground rule of all, bring your heart with you. When you fast, when you pray, when you give, when you look, when you figure out what's going on in life, bring your heart. Be real. Be honest. Be a person of integrity. Let that oneness show up, right? Because being a fake Christian, I don't know what that buys you. You know? I'm just play acting like I'm here because, you know, I'm supposed to be here because God told me to be here, so I'm here. And, you know, okay, let's get the Sunday over with so I can get home and watch the game or I can go do whatever. You know, our hypocrisy robs us of our reality in the Christian life. We will be substituting our reputation in place of our character. Which one's more important? What other people think of you or what God thinks of you? I can tell you which one's more important, right? You will be, when you're praying, you're just saying words instead of connecting. You'll be substituting money for devotion. Well, I put twenty dollars in the in the pass around plate, so I'm good this week. That's not devotion. You know, the glaring difference in all of these things is don't do it to be seen. Do it in secret. Do it from your heart. Get the deepest part of you involved in what you're involved in. What are you involved in? Church. No, you're not. I don't want you involved in church. Don't get involved in church. Get involved in God. This is the house of God. You should come to the house of God to hear from the king. To hang out with his people. To share fellowship. To love on one another. We should come here. One determined thing. Focus on God. Focus on him. Focus on his worship, on his praise, on what he's doing in my life, how I need him. Lord, show up today and talk to me about this issue because I got this issue going on. We should be here for one reason, him. Yeah, it's great to go through his word to point you back to him, right? It's great when Mark says something as long as it points you back to him. He, God doesn't want your external involved. He wants your internal involved. That will drag along with it, your external. In John 4.23 it says, But the hour is coming, and now is, when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such to worship him. Think about that. God is still seeking people who will worship him in spirit and in truth. I, that just blows me away. God isn't speaking or isn't seeking a church full of people. Every chair in here, clear full. He, that isn't what he's seeking. He's seeking the chair that has the heart that is seeking him. That's what he's seeking. You know, our hypocrisy robs us of our spiritual rewards. He says, you know, you're doing stuff to show off to everybody else. That's great. You have your reward. You get that pat on the back. You get the little gold star on your fridge. You know, oh, great. I had another good day. But we settle for that instead of God's eternal rewards. That he lays out and says, hey, they're available. You can have these two. Instead of gaining God's eternal approval, we desire man's shallow praise. We pray so many times without answers because we got to show up. We got to be real. We fast with no inner improvement in the man because we fast without having devotion during it. 
Our spiritual life becomes hollow, hollow. It becomes lifeless. You ever been there? You're like, man, I'm going through all the motions, but God doesn't seem to be connecting. That's because he's not in the motions. Where's your heart? What's going on? Are you real with him? Are you truthful? Are you just, Lord, you see what a train wreck I am this week. I need you help, you know, rescue me. To overcome the devastation of just living a religious, hollow, and shallow, empty life, just bring this along. Just make it lead you into prayer. Bring it along when you give, as you look at the world, as you do whatever religious activity might be listed in the thing, bring this. When you, bring, when you get real with God and you bring him really who you are, that's when he gets real with you. And I love that. God says, when you seek me with all of your heart, you're going to find me. So I come with a heart, and maybe my heart's broken. Maybe my heart's got all kinds of issues, and I just lift it up to you, to the Lord, and say, Lord, would you clean that thing out? Just get all that junk out of there. So when I come, you can fill it full of the goodness and the grace and the love and the care and the compassion, you know. I don't just want it to show off to other people. I want it so you can actually use me. Father, I, uh, I just pray for us, Lord. God, that you would take these words and you would bury them deep within us. Lord, that in some of us, they'd even haunt us a little bit that we wouldn't be able to get a good night's sleep. We wouldn't be able to just, you know, go about life until we have fixed or we have asked you to fix some of the issues in our life. Lord, our pride, our arrogance, our unforgiveness, our wandering eyes, the darkness that is within us. Worried about more about our reputation than we are about our character. God, there's so many things. Lord, these are your kids. Kids of the King. Sons and daughters of the Most High God. And you have told us, you have promised us you would be at work in our lives. And so, Lord, work. Lord, we open ourselves up and we say, Lord, if you see it, get it out of there. Lord, fill us with you. Fill us with your heart, with your mind, with your love. Let our hearts break for the things that make your heart break and let us sing and be joyful and praise for the things that bring you praise. Lord, teach us to be kingdom kids. Lord, lead us through this life. And Lord, teach us to send, send ahead, to invest in a kingdom that's without end. You don't need us. God, you want us. What a glorious thing that is. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.